Gwyneth, this coverage is part of the Your New Mexico Government Project. That's a partnership with KUNM Radio and the Santa Fe Reporter. One of the things Gwyneth tries to do each week is to get a diverse mix of lawmakers to talk to, whether that means political persuasion, gender, geography, or a host of other considerations. It's not always easy, but the 538 website points out New Mexico does it better than most when electing diverse women to public office. We'll start this line discussion with diversity on that 538 article. And Dave, the author say New Mexico has a long history of electing women of, of color, starting with Soledad Chavez Chacon being elected Secretary of State way back in 1922. Women have role models here. It's a very interesting thing, and things build when, once you start, isn't it? It's very well, interesting. It is, and, and mm -hmm. you know, I thought the article was quite interesting because it invoked um, Stephanie Garcia Richards, who is the state land commissioner. Right. But I, I would hedge it a little bit by saying, I was, I was running a PRC campaign, and we kept intersecting with her campaign when she was running for the state land office. Yeah. I mean, this woman, you can look at her, she is a gifted politician, right. whether she is male or female. And I think that, you know, when you look at her, her record in the House and how good she was, um, I, I'm, I'm questioning whether or not it's a female thing or it's a good politician versus a not a good politician. But That's fair. I think that it's also a question of, you know, with impeachment that happened this week, one you could only help but think about Barbara Jordan, who yeah. gave that speech coming out of the uh, House Judiciary Committee, which kind of someone one could say caused Richard Nixon to resign That's right. and so I think that you know I get a Just little case bit anybody doesn't know Barbara Jordan a legendary woman of color black woman from Texas from Texas who was right gave this amazing impactful. speech right. at the House Judiciary mm -hmm. Committee invoking you know Alexander Hamilton and the Constitution mm -hmm. and I think that you know this idea that a person you know this identity politics is something but you, you, when you see a good politician if you have an eye for it you know it's a good politician mm -hmm. and I think that you know I'm not convinced that we do anything special here except we have women who are good politicians. Pick up on that, Catherine, if you would. Is, is, it, is it what Dave's saying or is there something extra here we're, we're not seeing? Um, I, I would agree with him yeah. um, and um, my pastor back in Muskogee, Oklahoma used to call me his little Barbara Jordan oh. and so I loved Barbara Jordan um, and I do think that we have you know lots of women who are active um, in in politics in New Mexico and Emerge is doing a lot to train uh, mm -hmm. women to mm -hmm. run for office mm -hmm. and they've been very successful in winning and, um, and, and and one thing that I will say about the article is that when people talk about women of color that they kind of exclude black women in that in New Mexico it sort of follows that tricultural narrative again and so it's not necessarily true for black women although we do have two um, and and the article right. also talks about the fact that it's not just the number of women That's but right. the positions they hold well we should mention of course Cheryl Williams Stapleton yep institution she, yep she is she's Jane Powell yeah institution two. you know she's been there uh, forever and we hear yep. her voice Dan you know from Every state of the state address, we hear her voice, uh, you know, kind of leading the charge there. Your, your sense of this about women in diversity and how, you know, it's worked in New Mexico, is it just second nature for us now? We don't think about it that much? And, you know, well, I mean, you know, people got to remember we're a majority minority state. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's not like we're talking about, you know, we've got this diversity where, you know, the overwhelming majority of people in the state are, are, people of non-color. This, mm -hmm. this is a true majority minority state. So I think that's helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I think having a citizen legislature is helpful, mm -hmm. right? Because I mean, I think it gives an opportunity for more people that have time to get involved right. that, you know, if we were paying people $250,000 a year, you might not see that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, look, we served with tons of, I served with tons of women. I mean, Cheryl William Stapleton is a good friend of mine. Jane Padrell is a good friend of mine. Um, you know, they're great people. Look, Cheryl and I, I don't think we voted for the same piece of legislation ever, mm -hmm. um, but you know you couldn't find you know people that care more about their constituencies and what they're working on in New Mexico, mm -hmm. um, and so you know I, I think it is unique in New Mexico, and I think it's a, a, a uniqueness that we should embrace. I mean I, I remember when I served in the legislature, even on the you know the Republican side, you know we had African Americans, we had Hispanics, we had married women, we had single women, we had young, we had old, we had Native Americans. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it seems to the diversity seems to cross party lines in New Mexico too, mm -hmm. which I think is even is even more mm -hmm. of a telling uh, tale for our state yeah. than than it is just the numbers in general. Pick up on that if you would quickly. The the idea that again is this just second nature for us? It's something that we just do and don't think about. I mean, I think that New Mexico uh, culturally is more open probably yeah. to it, but I also think that it's uh, there's somewhat of a generational issue. I uh -huh. mean. 
of course, Cheryl Williams Stippleton and, and Jane Padrell have been there for a very long time. So they're both, right. in, they are institutions truly and, and great leaders. Mm -hmm. But I do think also that, you know, when I first moved to New Mexico after having spent time in Arizona in politics, worked in California, I was surprised at, at how few women there were in general, not just women of color, but women mm. compared to other states. In Arizona, I mean, I lived there at the time when we had a 50 percent, we had 50 percent women wow. and it was bipartisan. And I also lived there at the time when we had the Fab Five. All five executive right. offices were held by women. Right. And so um, I came here, and, and it very much felt like it was much. It was much more male dominated a, right. a, across both. You know, there was a lot of Hispanic, and there was a lot of um, um, non-Hispanic. I don't know <laughs> other other. Sure. And so, gotcha. but it does reflect, I think, um, <clears throat> culturally what we see in the state a lot more. But I, I also think there's been some very specific efforts to try to get more diverse voices right. elected um, on both sides, really. I sure. mean, we just had, you know, a Latina, first Latina governor ever, That's right. um, Republican. That's right. So there's been efforts on both sides That's to right. increase the numbers. Good points there. The diversity is really an easy topic to discuss. One place where the issue came to a head is the well of the House of Representatives, <coughs> where in January, Native activist Lee Mokino delivered an invocation in both English and Tewa that reminded lawmakers of Santa Fe's native past and called for less drilling near Chaco Canyon. That irked some lawmakers. The House has since had members say the invocation, and the Senate disinvited Mr. Mokino from a planned invocation there this month. Laura, I want to come back to you on this. The invocation is usually a benign affair. I mean, did Mr. Mokino overstep, or uh, did Speaker Egoff's decision smack of po politics? Or how, did, how did you read that? You know, I can see both sides of this. Okay. Issue. I really can. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, when you have somebody who's, who's got a history of activism <clears throat> mm -hmm. doing an invocation, I think you, you have to expect yeah, no that they're going to, right, you got to expect right. that there's going to be something much more edgy than a normal, you know, than a, than a regular sort of sure. invocation. And so I think, you know, I think he spoke from his heart. I think he was speaking about his truth and, and his experience and including that as part of mm -hmm. a blessing. Mm -hmm. um, and I, but I can also see the other side of it where people were, you know, they expect to have an invocation that's, you know, across different, um, right. you know, across the aisle, across different issues. Mm -hmm. and you don't want it to be one-sided or have it be political because mm -hmm. it's really important to a lot of people mm -hmm. to have that invocation right off the bat. You know, no, uh, let me get to Dave here real Absolutely. quick. Absolutely, sure. Can I get everybody in here? Um, the uh, interesting little footnote there, he was filling in that day, actually. Right. And, right. It, you know, maybe he just, the speaker didn't know what was up. I don't know if they ask, what are you going to talk about? What, you know, what's the invocation? Who knows? Yeah, I mean, you know, you we know. can always argue First Amendment rights. He gets to say what he wants, right? right? But I think that also, you know, when someone invites you to do something, it's a pretty high level, high profile thing that you do. Being polite and maybe not pushing a political agenda would be my suggestion. He mm -hmm. gets to do what he wants. Sure. Um, I think that the, the lawmakers, I mean, if everything is political about it, even when you're doing the invocation, I mean, mm -hmm. could we just have a little bit of a break? I, I think, you know, we could have just done it, keep it simple, right. and move on. You can, there's plenty of time to lobby in the hallways. Sure. You know, Jim Towns and Artesia, you know him. Um, I, I know he had a problem with it. He said the quote was, I agree with Speaker, with the Speaker that politically charged prayer has no place in this chamber, end quote. Yeah, you know, when I was there, we, we, you know, we had a longstanding rabbi that did a lot of it for us. Um, and he passed away a few years ago. Mm -hmm. We had, you know, Catholic priests, we had people brought, you know, and it was always, you know, I just felt like, you know, it was always asking to bless the chamber, asking everybody to work. You know, it was always kind of a nice little start to the day, right? It was kind of like mm -hmm. that, that speech before the... Before the mudslinging. Yeah, before the mudslinging. Right. Like, right. Can we all just get along? Can we all respect each other? Right. Just remember God's watching everybody. You know, and even even the folks who came in who, you know, were, I, I don't know what the word is, they'd come in and they'd talk about, like, Mother Earth, and they were very, you know, nobody got up and was like, you know, Mother Earth wants you to stop drilling. Um, right. I, I just think it was, I just think it was really poor taste uh, to go into a place to give this invocation. Right. Uh, invocation means prayer. It doesn't mean speech. It doesn't mean rally. And, you know, not try to walk out of there and say, look, I brought both sides together, gave them a few seconds before the bell rang and the fight was on mm -hmm. to kind of reflect on what they should think of. And I think it was the right move by the speaker to say we're just going to stop it. Yeah. You know what, just to push back a little bit, though, sure. I mean, I've been, I've sat in, I mean, I was raised Catholic. I consider myself recovering Catholic, but I've sat through, you know, uh, invocations, blessings, um, sermons that incorporated a lot of political views, um, you know, anti-abortion views, ah, um, you know. At the Roundhouse? Not at the Roundhouse, oh. but well, I'm saying if we're going to talk about blessings being non-political, many 
many clergy incorporate, you know, political agendas into their sermons. Mm -hmm. I think they should have given some parameters, you know, to mm -hmm. anybody who comes up to say that this is a non-political moment and that we just want to ask people to uh, invoke divine right action. And yeah. um, and then I would say to the speaker that just be honest about it and say that, you know, that didn't go as well as we'd like and so we're not going to do that any longer right. instead of saying that it wasn't political because it clearly it was. Yeah. I think it's a nice there. touch that Ne we're now having members actually do the invocation right. because they're they're in the trenches. They're That's in the right. And I don't understand why the speaker's running from the political comment because it seems like you know the people who were as fired up as anybody were the Republicans. So it's an opportunity. I mean, there was equal offense done. So right. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I, 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 That's a fair point. I think you should just embrace that and mm -hmm. take kudos with I it. I think because there may be a segment of the population, Native American, who feels like they feel very strongly about the issues that he spoke about yeah. and um, I don't think he wanted to offend them in any way by saying the issues he brought up were um, illegitimate somehow it was just more of a time and place so I think he probably yeah. was a little bit you know careful about yeah. calling it a political action it's a tough spot yeah. for sure that'll do it for our legislative look this week the session ends of course February 20th up next we talk to the producer of a podcast on the West Mesa murders and we're back with the line to talk about a lawsuit against Kirtland Air Force Base for the fuel spill cleanup.